Hello, everybody. It's 10.45, so I'm going to get started on time. Um, but as people meander in, I'm going to do the unimportant part, which is to introduce myself. <laughs> so I'm John Kennedy. On Twitter, I'm Commerce John. Feel free to tweet the hell out of the presentation <laughs> just for my benefit. Um, I'm a product director at Acquia. I've been in Drupal just over 10 years. Um, and uh, if you didn't see me earlier, I was waving my cowboy hat around in the pre-note. Everyone should come to the pre-note. It's early, but fun. Um, and I've actually been, uh, I've had my own Drupal shop. You know, I've worked for other Drupal startups. Um, and I've, uh, I've long time ago developed modules and developed lots of sites um, and sold Drupal a ton, actually. Um, and, uh, you know, the local development experience is really important in all of those situations. And I use a variety of local uh, development tools today. So, um, <coughs> So I'm going to go through the top eight considerations for choosing uh, a local development environment. Um, but the, the kind of the theme of this is that what I think is most important, especially for teams, uh, is composability and encapsulation. And we'll kind of get into that. So this is not a demo. <laughs> I have done plenty of demos, but I am not going to show you install processes for local de development environments. You can do that. <laughs> There's plenty of documentation uh, for, this, for the uh, products that I'm going to talk about. Um, but if you really want a demo, then I have plenty of them here, and you can ask me questions and find me later, and I can show you, you know, Lando and Dev Desktop and a whole range of other things. Um, so what I'm really going to dive into here, um, and I hope this is the value you get, is what questions should I ask when choosing a local development environment as a tech lead? Um, because this is actually quite a different uh, requirement. I'm going to talk about plenty of local development environments, uh, you know, plenty of products that suit you know, a variety of, of different people. But I think this is one of the really uh, kind of key pieces of value you can get here. Um, you know, probably a lot of you in the room are tech leads, and those who aren't will probably be, uh, if you're a developer, you'll probably be this at one point in your career. And booting up your team on a uh, standard local development environment is challenging um, and very beneficial if you get it right. So I hope this is what uh, it's kind of one of the key things you get out of this talk. I want to say thanks uh, to Jeff Beeman and Chris Urban because recently they ran the uh, Drupal Local Development Survey. Um, and uh, that, you know, they got 789 responses. Um, and that really measured a whole range of metrics uh, around uh, usage of local development environments. Um, and uh, you should check that out. I haven't got a link here, but it's really easy to find. Um, and you know that's a wealth of information on what people use now. Um, so that's that's really interesting. Uh, so here are the top eight considerations. <laughs> it was on the it was it was in the uh, the talk notes. So you know maybe you know these already. But I'm going to go through architecture, uh, command line tool support, uh, composability of environments, configurability of tests, support for other runtimes, tool sets. Um, toolset versus application, open sourciness, popularity, and options for commercial support. These are the, the things that I think are most important for uh, choosing local development environments. So let's talk about architectures to begin with. And actually, the whole talk is going to center around the, the idea that there are these different architectures you can take, uh, different uh, categories of local development experience. We're actually going to go through all of the other questions with the architecture in mind. So this is kind of the keystone. Uh, of my presentation is explaining what I mean when I talk about architectures. So <clears throat> there's really five a as I see it. Um, there's Docker, just like straight Docker. I've installed Docker and then I use you know, Docker Compose files. I use a whole range of other configuration mechanisms for Docker. Um, there's Docker Plus. So someone uh, really awesome has built uh, me something on top of Docker that makes Docker a lot easier. And we have plenty of these in the community. Lando, DDEV, Doxel, Outrigger. Um, then there's a native stack, and that means there is some kind of uh, install, uh, you know, installable program that will run all of these things for me on my, on my machine. Um, they're probably running natively, so they're running, you know, PHP is, in, is uh, if you're on Windows, is an XE, or, you know, is, is basically an executable, so is my SQL. The whole LAMP stack is there, running native on my machine, and someone else has managed that install process. So it could be MAMP or Acquia Dev Desktop. And there's uh, native DI... Uh, did I get this wrong? <laughs> you know, DIY. Um, and this is uh, when someone goes and actually uses, if you're on Mac, uses something like Brew. Um, if you're on Ubuntu, you know, AppGet, uh, to install all of these individually. Um, then VMs. 
um, you know, virtual machines, uh, there's a few examples, Drupal VM, VirtualBox, et cetera. So we're gonna kind of view all of these uh, considerations through the lens of these architectures. Um, so just to kind of get a little clarification on one of the, one, you know, I'm, I'm sure most of people in the room uh, know this, uh, but kind of the, the, uh, the big difference between uh, Docker and VM um, is about where the, where the separation lies or where the encapsulation lies. And I'll harp on encap encapsulation. I think encapsulation is great, but I think Docker is actually, uh, has actually done a better job of this. And what, uh, what Docker uh, is, is is a much lighter way. <laughs> I thanked you a minute ago, but anyway. Um, so uh, Docker is a much lighter way to encapsulate uh, these environments. And, um, and actually, uh, what, ha what happens with VMs, if you have many of them running, is they tend to be very heavy on your machine. Uh, in terms of um, memory, uh, so RAM, um, and also storage space um, versus uh, Docker, which you know it's like it's got one VM running and then a lot of these environments on top that can be homogenous, um, and that means you can have a lot, uh, a lot of a lot of things running at once. Um, this has really made Docker the ubiquitous installer for uh, for open source. And the way I think of it is, you know, if you're installing things um, in the early 2000s or 90s, you would have probably, you're on Windows and probably used a Windows installer. You know, every, every piece of software had a Windows installer. Now, every piece of open source software has a Docker, uh, you know, a, a Docker file. Um, and this is actually, uh, this kind of is a measure of the success of Docker and the success of its architecture. Um, so actually, uh, the tech lead for Lightning, uh, the Drupal team at Acquia, Adam Balsam, um, talked to me about some of the reasons he doesn't like Docker, um, and he actually uses a native stack, so I thought this was worth kind of giving the comparison. Um, but getting into the machine to do a task, uh, running uh, command line uh, commands, um, running builds, so you know, using, a, using Composer to, to do a build, running tests, uh, whether you use using BHAT or something like that, the file system performance and the file system permissions. And I think actually Docker Plus uh, fixes a lot of these. Um, but you know, I, I went out and talked to plenty of people about this, and, and this is kind of typical Docker issues I've heard in the past. That I think if you're still talking about these things, uh, you should have a look at some of the, the kind of Docker Plus uh, tools out there. Um, so other Docker issues with Windows, um, <clears throat> you want to be on uh, the latest version of uh, the Docker native for Windows, but that really only runs on Windows 10 Pro. Sad face, um, because, uh, because it has Hyper-V. And Hyper-V is technology that means you can speed up uh, virtualization, it's really awesome, um, and that's how now you can kind of run Ubuntu and a whole range of other OSs on top of Windows. Uh, what used to be there was Docker Toolbox, which is legacy and terrible and slow and blurg, um, but you can only run this if you have Windows 10 Pro. Pro. The good news is that Windows 10, it's just surpassed Windows 7 in market share. So most of you hopefully will be using uh, Windows 10 and you know if you're a professional developer, hopefully Windows 10 Pro. And the better news is that not many people use Windows anymore. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> so this came from the local dev survey um, and this is, this is you know, heavily biased towards Drupalist obviously because those guys, uh, you know, they, um, they uh, no Drupalists, um, but within Drupal, this is probably what we use, a pretty good representation, so, uh, yeah. So Docker Plus, um, just as summary as I see it, it does the things that Docker does, which is standardized environments and tooling across multiple OSs. Um, it encapsulates multiple configurations in your machine, but it also does these other things on top of Docker, which is uh, it stores higher level configuration in a version controlled <laughs> file. This is brilliant, I'll talk about this a little bit later. Um, it's easily customized and extendable, um, and works almost out of the box. Um, actually, when Dries today was showing in his keynote, uh, you know, the tons of steps, the Lando team very cleverly tweeted out, hey, guess what? It's one click if you do it on Lando. And that's true, actually. It's pretty easy to install Lando, you know, as an installer, type one command, have a Drupal. So if you haven't checked that out, check it out. Um, so I'm gonna talk about uh, command line tools. And now more than ever, there are a ton of command line tools that you wanna use with Drupal that have just become a necessity. Here are some of the logos, and here's some of the details. Um, so Drush 9, uh, Drupal console. There's a lot of crossover there, but still kind of Drush is more a sysadmin-y type uh, CLI, and Drupal console is more focused on developers. Um, and then there's Composer, which now you pretty much have to use uh, with Drupal 8 uh, to, do, to run builds, to bring in external libraries. 
uh, PHP unit for, for unit testing um, and then BHAP for behavioral testing goes down the line. Actually, if, it, if no one has heard of Thing and Robo, that's okay, but if you are building a distribution or you're building a Drupal product, these are really useful tools for automation. Um, you know, obviously, JavaScript is becoming more and more a part of, uh, of Drupal, and as we do things like bring React components into the admin theme, uh, you know, probably NPM is going to become a lot more important. Uh, Gold Grunt, uh, for the front end people here, I am not one of you, but I've heard these are important. Um, and BLT. BLT I put here as a placeholder because I know about it, but pretty much every, uh, every uh, kind of cloud provider has their own CLI tool. Uh, BLT is the good one for Acquia. Um, and it actually, uh, it does build, launch, and test, which means it will run your Drupal build, it'll, uh, you know, do a whole bunch of stuff. I'm going to not do this justice, but you know, find that guy later. Anyway, <clears throat> so here's our score, our scorecard. So ease of CLI uh, tool execution. Docker is pretty good. I can run a command in a docking container uh, with one line. Um, there are some foibles, but it works pretty well. Docker Plus is awesome, and the reason is that you can actually encapsulate some uh, configuration against those CLI tools within uh, that abstracted configuration file. So, uh, you know, if I go into Lando, I can actually, you know, put in configurations for Drush and things like this. Um, native stack is horrible because if I'm using MAMP, uh, then I've got, then it kind of breaks my whole process because I've had this easy install for my double clicky instally thing and then I have to go and install a command line tool which gets really complicated and there's versions of that, I've got to maintain it, it's horrible. Um, DIY native is okay, if you're doing a brew install on Mac OS then you know, brew install drush is also pretty easy and it'll run, um, but you've still got to maintain it yourself and there's no encapsulation, it just runs kind of on your machine, so it's okay. And VMs, similar deal. Environment configuration and testing. More and more important, really important in a team. So how long, and these, this is where we get to the questions. So as I said, the value, before, the value here, the big value is if you're a tech lead and you want to know the questions to ask, because these could lead to different answers. You know, I'm not, I like, I like Docker Plus, you know, so I like, and I particularly have been using Lando a lot, it's been pretty awesome. Um, but there are other, uh, other better options if you're, you know, depending on your team, and these are the questions to ask. So how long does it take for a developer to be onboarded is a big one. Um, you know, if a developer sits down tomorrow and they're a Drupalist, how long does it take to get my environments they're going to be working on? Uh, you know, maybe there's multiple projects. If I'm an agency, uh, you know, if I'm a Drupal corporate user, maybe there's, you know, a secure environment or compliance around it. Um, you know, I've got to get them productive. Um, does it, is it going to work easily with the IDE? You know, do I have access to those files that are within that uh, virtual machine? Uh, can I access the code base? Uh, is it all going to work together? Um, can I match versions of services with what I have in the cloud? Can I easily configure something like Solar you know, with, a, with a Solar configuration file so that it matches what I've got in my production environment? That can be really hard. Um, and can I write configurations in code and commit to Git so that that configuration file for Drupal, uh, you know, with the kind of environment set up and everything is just accessible with a Git pull. These are really important questions. Um, so this is, this is how I want to illustrate the difference between uh, an, an abstracted uh, configuration file on the left, Lando, and um, a very in the weeds, have to be a, well, probably want to be a systems administrator to configure it, um, configuration file for Vagrant on the right. So Vagrant is an excellent system. There are lots of good reasons to use it. Um, but Lando does a great job of abstracting all of the, the mess of configuring. And it's, it's, a, it's, a, you know, it's running in Docker and not, in, uh, not as a VM, as, you know, not on um, VirtualBox as Vagrant is. Um, but it's just a really good comparison to understand that the configuration files for, uh, for, for Lando and DDEV and other kind of Docker Plus solutions tend to abstract a lot of the mess. So you can configure Solar easily configure you know, a whole range of uh, you know, PHP, et cetera, uh, really easily within, within the um, configuration file. And this is what I've called composability. So I can compose my environment easily, share it with my team, have everyone onboarded, alter that in a, uh, you know, in a source controlled manner so I can have versions of my environments. Um, yeah. So does your team care about testing? Um, <laughs> Everyone, you know, should be doing. <laughs> everyone should be doing automated testing, and in a perfect world, we'd also have a ton of behavioral tests. Not everyone does this, but um, when you do run tests, they tend to be, you know, really critical uh, that you can run them easily. And if they're not easy to run, then people don't run them, which is, really defeats the purpose. Uh, so, can I run my BHAT test? Can I run my PHP unit tests? 
uh, within an environment is actually really critical to your team. Um, you want them running your tests and building tests easily. Um, so it's important to ask these questions. Is it important uh, for an everyday dev to run tests? How valid are my local tests? Do they, are they actually going to test for validity, validity in my production environment? Can I test the other services uh, that are being used in my production environment, like solar, et cetera? Um, and can I integrate that with my uh, build pipeline? So scorecard, um, configuration and testing. Docker's pretty good. Docker Plus is amazing. Um, the native stack, like MAMP, or, uh, is pretty horrible uh, for trying to share configurations. Probably the tech lead has to walk around to your desk. Um, similarly, with uh, do-it-yourself native, uh, tech lead probably has to walk around to your desk, um, which is a challenge. You know, you could have the, the team members just kind of setting this up on their own and having a go and using their versions of PHP and doing all of this, but um, you can end up in some pretty bad places down the track when they've run tests and they're not valid or valid, but they're not valid in production or the rest of the team has trouble uh, collaborating. Uh, VMs are pretty good at this as well because you can have a, a configuration file for them. So runtimes other than PHP and Drupal. Now, there's a lot of talks going on um, here about uh, should Drupal be a backend? Um, you know, what if I want to run an Angular or React front end? Um, and maybe you have a non-standard uh, backend that Drupal relies on. You can think of Solar as a backend, but there's a whole range of custom uh, services that companies build uh, that are integrated with Drupal uh, you know, that you might need to test for in your environment. Uh, so these become really important questions. Do I need to boot up some kind of parallel environment that is going to run Node um, so that I can actually show my whole application running uh, in one place? Um, and so uh, that's, that's pretty important considerations. Um, and, you know, and beyond that, um, in that environment, so if I'm thinking about Node, what protections do I have against dependency conflicts? Um, how will I update it? Can I run NPM in that environment as well? Um, can I snapshot the state of that non-Drupal environment? Can I bring these services up quickly as in kind of, can I turn them on quickly? Um, how easy do they install? How do I configure versions? Um, the, the scorecard is, uh, let me see. There we go. Scorecard is pretty um, self-explanatory. If you're doing, doing this on a native stack, it's nigh impossible. Um, you'd never, you'd, to have like a double-click install for MAMP, then there's going to be no kind of good corresponding double-click install for NPM. You can do it uh, with Brew, uh, do it yourself. Um, and, you know, but it, it gets messy. And the problem with VMs here is that people end up using multiple VMs for this. And you have a really heavy system. So especially if you start doing multiple projects and then I've got multiple Drupals and nodes running and they're all VMs, it gets really heavy on my machine, um, even with a really kind of fast machine. Um, but Docker and Docker Plus sort this out pretty well. Uh, you know, you can run just with Docker native, you can run lots of uh, you know, Docker containers pretty easily um, and Docker Plus does it well, pretty too, pretty well, does it well as well. Okay, out of the box, in case you didn't know this acronym. I think pretty much everyone does. <laughs> um, number five. Uh, so this is really important to think about for your site builders or maybe uh, your front-end front devs who aren't kind of in the, in the development code. Um, maybe team members that are onboarding or, or new or junior. Is there a UI? You know, can, I, uh, can I see my environments? Um, this gets really important too. If you have lots of projects running, it's good to be able to see all of your environments uh, whether well, that's because you're building multiple projects, or you're demoing, or you know, there's a range of use cases where UIs become uh, pretty good. Is there an installer so I can just download something, and double click on it? Um, cloud synchronization is big. So, for instance, Lando has published, I think now, documentation for all three big clouds. Whether you're on uh, Acquia or Pantheon or Platform SH, it's a pretty easy way to synchronize uh, Lando with your cloud environments, which is pretty amazing. Thank you to that team. <laughs> um, and then CLI tools, uh, do they come with the CLI tools? As in, do they package up Drush or do they package up uh, Drupal Console or Composer or one of these? Um, so it depends because early on it feels like uh, a native stack like MAMP uh, is you actually, I think it was in the Dries node even, or, you know, there was an, someone installing with MAMP um, that Dries was showing. And early on it feels pretty good. Like early on uh, I can install it gets up and running pretty quickly. I can see my environments. That's pretty great. Um, but 
if you start to need multiple environments, um, this and you need to update versions of PHP or other, other systems, it gets hard. Um, and actually, uh, the, the kind of process to, uh, to keep up to date with all of those CLI tools and you know, all of the other things you need becomes a lot easy, easier with Docker Plus. Um, because that kind of that system will maintain all of your containers that do all the things that you need, and it becomes just kind of one command uh, for a lot of the updates. Um, open sourceiness. So um, this is an interesting one. I think the reason you want your uh, local dev environment to be particularly open sourcey is because uh, then you can potentially extend it, you can potentially contribute to it if there's bugs that you particularly need uh, solved. Um, you know may not be tied to a cloud vendor then, so if you're an agency and you need to go out and have environments on all three clouds, it's gonna be easy to work with all of them. Um, and will it persist? This is a big one. If there's proprietary, uh, you know, local dev software, they may not put versions out very frequently, they may miss versions of PHP, they may, there's a whole range of issues you, you can encounter and they may just disappear. Uh, so I think actually open sourceiness is actually really important. Um, so, uh, the scorecard here, native stack's bad. Um, everything else is fine. <laughs> pretty much all the tools everywhere else, uh, they're gonna be pretty good. Uh, they're gonna be pretty uh, open source, but that's one of the big reasons to stay away from native stacks. Popularity. So I, I, I read um, a lot of tweets and a lot of blogs uh, before I made the first version of this presentation. It was actually for Drupal Camp, New Jersey. Um, I gave this presentation for the first time and there's a lot of people saying things that were not valid anymore. They were judging architectures on experiences they had had years ago, and um, it was kind of ridiculous. So that's kind of one of the reasons I put the talk together is because I wanted a, an evaluation of them all on a level, you know, and I tried everything out. Um, so it's not always productive to go to Twitter or blogs to kind of understand uh, what is the best environment to use, um, but there is an exception. Ultimike recently put together um, a great little uh, blog post and I created the bit.ly link so that you could copy it down today. <laughs> He's gone for a much more technical evaluation of um, some local development environments um, and so, so that's pretty good. Other than that, it's always useful to look on GitHub, not just stars but also activity um, and the issue queue, the responsiveness of uh, contributors um, to, see, to see how quickly they respond to issues. Um, how many people in the room have been using Drupal for under a year. One, two, three. Okay, right. That somewhat corresponds to the survey. <laughs> um, and you know, there's lots of community knowledge um, that takes a while in Drupal at the moment to kind of twig onto is like how to use Drupal.org properly. How do we work out? Uh, where the modules there are mature, similarly with local development environments. Um, you know, I would say that um, it's good to evaluate all these factors, um, and you know, I hope this presentation gives you a leg up, um, but it's really worth talking to your peers and talking to everyone here, because everyone has a different experience with, uh, with uh, local development environments, and um, that's a good way. I mean, popularity is important because it means that, once again, the solution will persist and uh, you know, probably gets updates quickly. Um, so these are good, some good ways to judge that, but also talk to your peers here, especially if you're new in Drupal. So this is what the survey says. At the moment, we have a ton of people using Drupal VM, um, and that's great, excellent solution. Um, and it, it um, you know, is a really great out-of-the-box Drupal environment. I can turn this on, and it will run my Drupal, which is brilliant. Um, I think that, uh, of all the solutions out of the box, if you just want a really simple one, instead of going to uh, MAMP or something like that, I would suggest just really simple solution. VM is gr uh, Drupal VM is great. It's worth having. You know, it's worth checking it out, um, and that's why it's so popular. Uh, and you can kind of see down the line, um, custom Docker is pretty big as well. Lando's got a lot of traction. Um, MAMP has great traction. I think what we'll see is a migration into um, into Docker Plus and uh, you know, still persisting with Drupal VM uh, going forward. But it's really interesting to see what people are using now. As I said, once again, this survey is quite biased because the set of people that would have answered it are probably advanced Drupal devs in that little community. Uh, but it's kind of, it shows you the way forward. Because those guys using it, then, uh, then you know, it's probably, they're probably onto the, the right thing. 
Commercial support. So um, there are situations, with large, la large companies um, may need uh, support for compliance and security reasons. Um, this becomes really important if you uh, have big offshore teams with projects uh, with companies that require uh, compliance and security. It could be in healthcare or government or uh, other sectors. Um, and so it can be really important to get quick answers to questions, quick bug fixes, um, and also kind of some assurance around the security. Um, and this is often provided by a cloud vendor, but what you may not all know is that uh, Lando and other teams will do this as well. If you go to them, uh, you know, have a chat, if you're uh, a big corporate user of Drupal, uh, they can actually provide you uh, with a support contract. They'll do that. Um, they'll be on the line for you and kind of, you know, via chat. And this is really useful uh, to get over some hurdles uh, when you're worrying about is, you know, is my uh, development environment going to be used by maybe hundreds of developers uh, going to be able to be supported. So report card on that. Docker's not great at this. There's no kind of sense. It's, it's hard to get support around it because Docker is the general use case. So getting support for Drupal on Docker is not really a thing. Um, and you know, do yourself native. Uh, not so much either, because you know, Brew, once again, it's everything. It's not just Drupal, so getting Drupal support for that. I think um, you know, Drupal VM, the, uh, Jeff's really responsive, um, but it's not commercial support. Um, so really what you're left with is going with uh, something like Acquia Dev Desktop, which is a native stack, uh, or Docker Plus environment, because a lot of these companies, as I said before, will actually support it for you. Bonus round, um, and then you know I'll talk about a couple of things, and we can have some questions. Uh, so, uh, Drupal Dev team size. This is interesting, and the top line is probably you know it's the whole world. So look at that first. If you're interested in regions, it's below that. But the top line says that uh, you know there's a huge chunk of teams that are just one to two people. Maybe you don't need uh, composability and um, and encapsulation so much if you're one to two people. Uh, maybe it's not as big deal, but if you get to three to five, if you're in a team of three to five, then onboarding, encapsulation, composability are massive, uh, and beyond that, they're just you can't live without it. So that's a that's a big uh, kind of plot of Drupal. Uh, so you know, if you're in those categories, uh, which probably most people are, uh, I, I think those those things are absolutely critical uh, to keep your onboarding time low, uh, your consistency high, uh, and so you can you can test, etc. So this is one um, by role. Um, you know, systems administrators who are used to configuring infrastructure, um, they can use you know, all of these pretty well. Um, but they're going to prefer solutions like Docker and Docker Plus and, and VM that feel like a server, you know, feel like they can configure it down to the nuts and bolts. Um, they don't like native stacks because it's hard to control them. Um, whereas developers uh, might tend towards uh, you know, using Brew or using um, using uh, Docker Plus, it's a little bit faster and easier to get running. Uh, site builders, um, that's, that's where a native stack becomes really uh, a lot easier, but you know, I know that uh, the Lando team have, all, have previously built Calabox, for instance, they intend to eventually build a UI, and other uh, you know, command line Docker Plus tools I think will build a UI as well, and as soon as that drops, it's gonna shift, and uh, even for your site builders, it's just gonna be easier to install this uh, kind of UI that's based on top of a, a Docker uh, plus stack. Um, and then development team leads, uh, you know, and this is kind of what I said it's worth coming to this presentation for, it's Docker plus all the way. Like it's, there's just way too many reasons uh, kind of as, as I've gone through with these, uh, these eight uh, considerations that a team lead uh, should be really getting onto one of those Docker plus solutions. They're brilliant. They've had some problems in the past. Um, and some bugs, but I feel like right now is a great time to try them again if you haven't in the past. Comparison by company type. So uh, Drupal agencies, dev shops, integrators tend to have a lot of Drupal projects. Uh, you know, they, you know, a, a particular team member might have three running at once, but they've probably got, you know, 10 they've used in the past couple of years, um, and it might be important to jump back uh, to one of those at some point. They're probably homogenous stacks. They've got different technology within them. Um, and being able to uh, still have these on the machine so I can boot them up quickly and spin things down and up and have multiple ones running without really weighing my, uh, weighing my machine down um, is really important for those teams. And that's kind of why 
uh, of everyone using local dev solutions, Docker Plus is the absolute best for them because, uh, because they're not weighed down by many VMs. Uh, there's a composability and, and encapsulation, et cetera. Um, the kind of exception to this rule, so for instance, Adam Balsam, who develops Lightning, really likes a native stack. And that's really because he's developing something that's not Drupal sites. He's developing a Drupal product. He's creating something, uh, you know, a distribution that will be uh, used to build lots of Drupal sites, but he's really thinking about one code base. And so it doesn't require a lot of environments to be spun up. He's really thinking about one environment. It's pretty easy to manage. Um, and then a corporate Drupal team, um, like the Drupal agency, probably has a couple of different experiences, but they also have probably lots of different technologies uh, they need to integrate there, and maybe other services in other languages. And so once again, it becomes really important uh, for them to use something, uh, you know, at least Docker or Docker Plus to be able to configure and build those services within the same environment. So that's about my presentation, and I'd like to take uh, questions now. So we have tons and tons of time. <laughs> that was a lot faster than the last time. Anyway, uh, questions from the audience? Yes? Could you briefly go back to the slide that shows what is within Docker Plus? Yes. This one or earlier? This, this list? No? Yes, thank you. Yes, OK. This is probably an important one. <laughs> is that, that's like the whole question? That was easy. OK. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Next yeah. question. Yeah. Uh, which section? Uh, native stack emoji. Uh, okay, actually, I'm sorry. <laughs> they all have emoji. Every, every yeah, consideration has emoji. I'm not doing my question very well here. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> Definitely has to do with team size. Um, so if you're a little team, you know, you're like one to two people, then great, I'm gonna install my thing and that's pretty good. Um, and you know, once again, for those who weren't, if you're for the right, for the beginning, which is kind of the keystone, <laughs> it's kind of uh, native stack is really an install alike map um, versus do it yourself native, which is something like brew on the command line where I'm kind of installing everything uh, manually myself. Um, so corporate team, um, doesn't like the installer because uh, they may have services running. So I might have a JavaScript application, I might have a backend service. Um, those are going to be then separate things I have to install and maintain separately and I can't bring that all into an environment and, then I, and I can't certainly kind of run a branch of an environment and over here on my machine and see the effect of that code branch in context of all those services. Um, you know, often corporate environments are a homogenous set of services. And that's kind of, I think, the big deal. Um, as I said on one of the other slides, it seems easy early on. Like early on, yeah, I can install something, Drupal's running. But that's not really the development process. You know, getting Drupal to an admin screen is not the development process. Um, you know, installing modules, having branches of my code, being able to do updates really easily, kind of do, doing hot fixes and having that in this environment, that tends to be what the Drupal uh, development process looks like. And that gets really messy. Uh, with a native stack or, or a DIY native. Yes? <coughs> um, do you have any uh, information about what typical onboarding like time? Is it like a few hours or a day or a week? What is typical? Yeah, so if you, um, if you have a Drupalist and they know their IDE, uh, then, you know, I've, I've set up... Um, Lando, uh, you know, in 15 minutes, 
and had people productive. Um, if you go, uh, one of the other solutions like Docker, um, there's a setup time. You as a team can have a Docker Compose file that you run, um, and that can make you pretty productive, because then I, in, it's in my Git repo, I download it, I run kind of, uh, you know, I run Docker, it brings up all the containers. Um, you just have to do more work. You're maintaining all of those services and all of those versions and knowing what all the containers do. Um, so there's some extra work that the team lead has to do to kind of maintain that, um, that Docker Compose file. Um, onboarding is not onboarding because for a native stack, I double click. Once again, I have something in 15 minutes, but I'm maybe not onboarded to how to do a branched environment or do something that I'm probably going to have to do in a couple of weeks. So onboarding tends to run then for a long time. And it's really kind of been the default option of people to install something like MAMP. Um, and the problem is that then onboarding, you, you kind of, it, it just keeps going. The questions keep coming, you know, how do we do this? And, you know, so that's, um, so if you, are you talking about onboarding specifically like to getting Drupal running or are you talking about kind of training? Yeah, so um, if I was going to set up a machine uh, for a developer, typical developer, I would have to have an IDE, I would have to have uh, the PHP environment, the MySQL environment, I maybe have to have solar or search environment, some other things running. Um, I've probably got to have Composer, I've probably got to have you know, all of those CLI tools I talked about a minute ago, uh, a minute ago, right at the beginning of the presentation. Uh, there we are. Um, you know, all of these tools installed on that machine. Um, so maybe as, a, maybe as a shop or a, a corporate, I put together some kind of build script for this. Um, but I'm just here to tell you that someone's done it for you. <laughs> you know, you can go out and use a, a kind of a Docker Plus stack. And they've, um, if they haven't included these tools, they've made them really easy to use. Um, and they've made them configurable. Um, so I guess onboarding for a developer, if you have all of that set up, configured for your environment, you know, your corporate IT might be able to do that for you and it might be just turn it on and oh, I'm going to show them some things. And if they're a Drupalist, they'll understand how to use all these command line tools. But then there's a ton of maintenance you have to do around that stack. It's really heavy, you know, like configuration and these kinds of things you have to keep uh, maintained. Whereas if I use one of these solutions that's a little bit abstracted, um, you know, DDF Lando, it's a Docker Plus solution. There's someone else who's maintaining all, most of the kind of heavy lifting of that uh, broad configuration. Then I can just do very minor strokes, like I want to use PHP 7.2, or I want to use kind of this version of uh, MySQL, or I want to use this version of Solar, etc. Um, yeah. Hope that's a better answer. Yes. Um, do you know the time frame when they'll actually have the UI for uh, Lando set up? Because that's kind of a barrier for a lot of our clients. Like a lot of them like that kind of turnkey solution, like Dev Desktop or whatever. But um, uh, that seems to be kind of a like a barrier of entry for them. Interesting. Um, there are various timelines. You probably have to speak to Alec. Um, that's changed a little bit. They've prioritized a lot of the features in the back end, uh, and I think that works for a lot of. Um, dev shops, but as I said before, for site builds, it's really important to have a UI. Um, for Lando, speak to Alec. You know, all the other teams I've got on that screen, um, they've probably got different answers to this. Um, I would expect Lando to have it later this year, but um, probably best to, to ask them. Yeah, I, I don't see any um, big performance differences. They've solved some of the problems. So for instance, if you use, Fire, if you use Docker, um, then you have to work out how you're doing, uh, how you're seeing files locally. So I've got my IDE running locally. It's just running on my machine. And it needs to be able to access the code base and it needs to be able to, you need to be able to use it like a user. So users upload files, right? And so I need, uh, so that performance can get dragged down if you don't uh, implement Docker the right way, uh, whereas Lando and others tend to have just sorted that out. Um, it's just Docker. You know, they've created a command line tool that does a lot of Docker com uh, configuration for you, and that's great. 
Um, but essentially, it's just running on top of the native Docker stack. So it's got the same performance characteristics. They've done a better job at configuration. So that sometimes that helps you with performance. But there's no, um, there's no kind of, uh, what's it called? There's no, there's no heaviness in the solution. It's not kind of giving you an, ex an extra overhead. Definitely. I think, you know, I said this before, but if you haven't used Docker in a while, especially if you're using Docker Toolbox on top of Windows or Mac, try it again. It's very different with the native solution. Uh, Mac, I can't remember when it was released. It could have been last year or the year before. Mm. Um, they, they released their native solution. Uh, Windows 10 Pro, as I said before, um, has a native solution. Performance characteristics are very different. Um, obviously, with Linux, it was always very fast, but if you're on, you know, as we saw before, most people using uh, Mac OS um, and getting to the native installer for a Docker was very important for performance. Yes? So just to repeat the question as I understand it, um, are there good solutions to bring developers into DevOps? Sure. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think the Lando documentation got a lot better. I think uh, lots of people are working on documentation. Um, I think ultimately, uh, though, the important uh, there's, there's always going to be a, you know, a tech lead on the team who's going to be kind of enabling a solution, but I've seen a lot fewer errors uh, or a lot fewer times when a developer has to reach out to someone on one of those Docker Plus stacks because it solves a lot of the problems and they're working on all the bugs around Drupal, not just getting an environment running, but around Drupal. Um, so you know, Drupal doesn't install Y. That will be fixed by the Lando team in their configuration rather than your team with your Docker Compose file. Um, so it tends to lead to less helplessness going with something like Docker Plus. And if you haven't tried it recently, you know, they went through alphas and betas, there were problems, uh, try it again. <laughs> that's, my, that's my advice. In terms of DevOps in general, um, I don't know the, the best resources um, uh, to, to bring uh, developers over. Um, I think there's a, been a big move towards DevOps recently, but you know, maybe I'll post a blog on that later. <laughs> uh, there was a guy over there that I missed. I think it was, but I'm going to go with you first. Yeah. Okay. So Drupal VM seems pretty popular there. I'm wondering, where are some of the things that it lacks in? Um, like, what would make you go somewhere other than Drupal VM? So um, I think Drupal VM has been around a while. Um, that's one of the reasons it's so popular, um, because for a long time, I've just been able to install this, uh, you know, uh, VirtualBox Vagrant-based system from a Vagrant file 
um, that will bring up a web page that shows me my Drupal environment with my you know, other environment variables, my SQL, et cetera. So I understand it because it looks something like MAMP. It's got all of my stuff there. Um, so it, it was a good, it's a great solution. You know, I don't want to knock Drupal VM, it's brilliant. Um, I think that it lacks, uh, as I said before, because if you start running multiple VMs, it gets very heavy. Um, I also don't think the configuration settings are as friendly for developers, uh, specifically, as, um, as some of the, the newer Doc Plus based stacks. Like I'm down in the details. I think it was one of these slides I had um, there, that one. Like on the right is Vagrant's configuration. Um, this is what you have to deal with, um, you know, if you're kind of running on one of those stacks, whereas on the left is kind of an abstracted configuration that understands Drupal somewhat, understands, understands the other services. So I think it's really about performance. Um, if you're running multiple environments, if you're running, if you're a dev shop and you've got lots of projects or you know, you've got lots of reasons to lot, run lots of Drupals or other services, um, and then also configurability. That's, that's where I would see the difference. And just like getting back to that slide. Yes. One of our requirements, or hopes at least, was to make our local dev environment closer to production. Yes. Configuration component sort of as much as possible. Do you have a, a backup slide that shows how Pantheon, Acquia, and or others are getting closer to giving us an addition? <laughs> yeah. Um, coming from Acquia, I would say that it's not um, it's not crystal clear as to how I would make a Lando configuration exactly like, like Acquia. But the thing is that Lando is so easy to configure, like as in change the, my versions, that I can match the versions in cloud pretty easily. So I haven't got a magic button yet, even though there is actually a really good blog post on how to kind of bring environments down from Acquia. That's a part of it. Oh, sorry. Um, but, uh, but the configuration is so easy that it's actually pretty easy to match my cloud environment. There's going to be some gotchas, um, and that could be in the, the built and test, or it could be, um, it could be in kind of uh, settings that are very particular to your environment. But I'd say most of the things that you can do um, in those cloud solutions can be mirrored pretty quickly because of the abstraction in those configuration files. <coughs> yeah. There will be better ways in the future. <laughs> Dev, Dev Desktop at Acquia is actually pretty good at this, um, but it's not going to be the solution in the future. So, yeah, new stacks and architectures, all that. Yes. Um, I don't think my organization has maybe I don't know, 15, 20 developers, and um, one of the limitations we found was we were, you know with using Docker or VMs was collaboration between them, since all this code is only on the local machine. So we ended up standing. Yeah, so I guess um, developers usually like to have their code local for latency um, and for refresh, because then once you've got a remote server, there's probably caching on it, and you've probably got to you know upload your hit save, and then it's got to click over, and then you and if you're doing so, I guess philosophically, like moving from Java, you've got to compile it to PHP. One of the big advantages was, hey, I can change this colon or this semicolon, hey, everything works, you know, instantly. So it's about that really quick kind of agile cycle of development, or you know micro cycle where I'm just changing particular uh, characters um, and that tends to make people want to use something local. That said, there are lots of really interesting um, new web IDEs coming out like Cloud9 um, that kind of uh, try to make that possible by putting the IDE in the browser as well and then it's really close because like you change something my like IDE in the browser and then it's instantly the same on the cloud anyway. Um, I would say though that the problem you're having I would think is solved by the composability of, of something like Lando because uh, it is really about taking all of those configurations that you've got um, and putting them in a, uh, in a configuration file that's in your Git repo. So when I do a Git pull and then I can go Docker, so I can go Lando start, suddenly I have an environment that's exactly the same as the rest of my development team uh, with all the services configured exactly the same as the rest of my development team. So hopefully like that's the solution you use to get around that problem. Um, I have had experience running a dev server remote, uh, but yeah, 
for the reasons I said before, I don't think it's a great... It, it, it might be right for you, but you know, it, it tends to be not what developers want. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, it's my okay. silly naming convention. <laughs> Uh, I did a lot of work with Lando. I'm always going to have a bias because I picked that up a long time ago and kind of have been following it along its development path. Um, I think the other guys have some great things going for them, but when I recently tried out um, DDEV and Doxel and Outrigger, I couldn't find necessarily any big advantages to using different ones, so I'm just going to use Lando as my example. But pretty much all of these have the same uh, set of advantages um, about composability, encapsulation, and kind of abstracting all the stuff that you have to deal with in Docker or, or um, VM files. Um, so, yeah, Lando's my good example. Okay. You wouldn't say it's necessarily way better than the other. I like it. <laughs> but, <laughs> um, but, yeah, I, I think um, I would choose this category. That's my message here. I would choose Docker Plus for a variety of reasons that I mentioned in the presentation. You should probably then do your own research on what each of these do better or worse or, you know, um, and then kind of try them out. Um, I did, but I just used Lando a lot more. <laughs> Cool. Yes? Uh, if you use Docker in a dev environment, does that mean that you need to use Docker on production as well? No. And this is actually like this question we had over here. It's like, how do I match my configuration on my server versus locally? And I think there's a big push. So one of the reasons people love Docker is theoretically you can do that. Like I can push my container. Um, and that's been a kind of a development uh, development move. Lots of developers want to push their container because then they really know that it's just the same in production as it is locally. But that's not always practical because the way that um, production systems are set up, certainly, so at Acquio, you know, we run massive sites like NBC Olympics that have hundreds of millions of hits to them. Um, and we're not going to use the Docker file that we use locally uh, in that instance. It just isn't practical. Um, and most of the reasons that uh, your code will execute differently, aren't affected by those differences. So, you know, how we've done it is, um, you know, as I was saying before, <clears throat> there's a number of configurations and versions uh, for those services. So I have got, uh, you know, my solar configuration file. I might have my PHP ini for, P uh, for PHP. I might have, uh, you know, my.conf for my um, MySQL. And those things you can pretty easily uh, bring down and have within, uh, within a Docker Plus configuration. Um, it's really about matching your cloud environment. I think in the future, clouds will do a better job of giving you those configurations directly into something like this. I don't think Drupal, um, I, I don't think that we'll get to the point where these, uh, where the clouds are allowing you to push your containers from one of these development environments to production, because that's kind of backwards. Um, you know, uh, these, um, the people on these teams are maintaining these uh, Docker containers and images for the purpose of local dev. Um, and if anything, they should be, you know, getting an open source container that, you know, Acquia Pantheon or Platform specifies as their production container and bringing it down. That may happen, um, but it just seems like there's different goals. So I don't think you're going to be pushing containers to production anytime soon. Anyone? Yes? Um, yeah. I think I sell it um, based on the abstraction and based on the less work to get to security. And also, if I'm going to go different, ver like if I need to update a version of, uh, of one of these uh, packages, it's just a lot faster to bring for my whole dev team. CISO is really concerned with production, though. So probably not as big a concern locally, um, my experience. Uh, but if they are really concerned about local, then it's on the versioning. Uh, you can quickly get to the next version. Uh, you know, you don't have to think about as much of the configuration, so there's lots of less things you can do wrong, uh, which is good. Uh, I mean, all of these should be behind your, like, local firewall anyway, so no one should... There's not many times you've got a local dev environment that has open... <laughs> I say that, but <laughs> people do it. <laughs> you shouldn't have open ports on your Mac. I'm sure this probably has, but anyway. Um, yeah. Is there any more on that, or...? Well, any? It's just around, it's just around like, setting up VMs or anything, like, containers and like that. Yeah. Have you, got, have you had particular questions from a CISO around that locally or? Okay, <laughs> maybe later, yes. I just want to say that all four of those uh, Docker Plus uh, tools are represented on the show floor here. So yes, they are. That is a good point. Questions directly. 
I didn't say that, but for everyone in the room, uh, all of the Docker Plus uh, you know, teams here are actually on the show floor. So uh, don't take my word for it. Go and ask them questions. Um, they're great teams, and I respect all of them. So. You can even use your images, I think, within um, Docker Plus if you have custom images that you want to use. So if you've got some kind of absolute requirement to use that particular image, you can. I think their configuration files will still benefit you, and I think the way that their CLI tool works will still benefit you, um, but probably a better question to actually go and ask them, um, and they'll have a better answer about your custom Docker container. Um, there are lots of reasons that can be great, especially for custom services. I guess that's probably the use case you have is you're building a container for a custom service. Um, and that's, that's probably a, a good reason to use your own container because you have it in production, you have it here, and it's some microservice or some JavaScript application. Um, yeah, but have a chat to them about that. All right. We've probably got time for one more question. We have three minutes left. Is there anyone else? Or can I just bow and you can clap? Oh, no, wait, we've got one more. <laughs> yes. Um, so uh, I, I really like the VLC tools that you guys put together. Yeah. Um, it, it's almost like a prerequisite for Site Factory. And um, I, I noticed that you don't really have any documentation or any type of like um, <laughs> inclusion of Lando. Yeah. Um, has there been discussion about Absolutely. The Lando, the Lando team have actually done an integration with us, and we're just behind. Um, and I, you know, I think we're going to be doing a lot of documentation around that fairly soon. Uh, we've got a new team who's just working on that local development experience right now. A new product manager coming in as well, actually, on my team for that specifically. Um, and uh, yeah, so soon to come. <laughs> right. Okay. Thank you all for coming. I'm going to bow.